Okay, so you can check your answers to the questions on exchange in plants. Heart and circulation. Now you'll see my photograph here of a model heart, which we have in school, and it shows sitting on the top of the main body of the heart are those strange little pink earlobe shaped things. Those are the left and right atria. They're strange looking little lobes. And the main body of the heart is the other two main chambers, the left and right ventricle. Now because the heart is an organ which requires its own supply of glucose and oxygen and nutrients, it has its own blood supply and you can see that I've labelled the coronary artery. This is the main artery which supplies the heart muscle with its own blood supply. So the heart is an organ and definition of an organ is something that's made up of several different types of tissue which work together. So the heart contains different types of tissue. The heart wall itself is predominantly muscle tissue but of course it also contains nervous tissue, it contains epithelial tissue, which is the covering tissue of organs, and it has its own circulation, so it will contain circulatory tissue, it has its own capillaries and arteries and veins. So this shows a simplified diagram of the structure of the heart. Now these diagrams are always shown as if you're looking at the heart in a person's chest. So you're looking at them front on, which is why the left ventricle and left atrium are shown on the right. So you're looking at this person and that's how the heart is orientated in their chest. Now you're expected to be able to label the four chambers of the heart, the left and right atrium and the left and right ventricle. You're expected to be able to label the four main blood vessels entering and leaving the heart. You're expected to know the vena cava going from the left which brings blood from the body, the pulmonary artery which carries blood from the right ventricle to the lungs, the pulmonary vein which carries blood from the lungs to the left atrium and the aorta which carries blood to the body. And you're also expected to be aware of the fact that valves exist in the heart and that the function of valves is to prevent the backflow of blood to ensure that blood flows continually in the correct direction. Now mammalian circulation or circulation of mammals is known as double circulation and the reason is because the blood passes through the heart twice for each complete circuit of the body. So it goes from the heart to the lungs then back to the heart then round the body. The valves ensure the one-way flow through the heart. The atria contract and force blood into the ventricles and then the ventricles contract and force blood out of the heart. And it's important to remember that blood never crosses from left to right in the heart. The left side and the right side are kept completely separate. You're expected to understand the basic structure of the main blood vessels. Arteries, now the definition of an artery is a vessel that carries blood away from the heart. Now people often say, oh, arteries carry oxygenated blood. Now that's not always true because the pulmonary artery carries blood away from the heart towards the lungs and that blood isn't yet oxygenated, so that's not a good definition. So arteries carry blood away from the heart. And this blood is under high pressure because the heart has a strong contraction. So these blood vessels have thick walls to withstand this high pressure. And the walls contain muscle and elastic fibres. Veins carry blood towards the heart. It's not true to say that veins carry deoxygenated blood because the pulmonary vein carries blood from the lungs to the heart and that's oxygenated so that's not a good definition. Veins carry blood towards the heart. They have thinner walls than arteries because the blood is at altogether a much lower pressure. They often have valves to prevent the backflow of blood so along the length of the vein there are often valves to ensure that the blood carries on in its journey towards the heart and doesn't pool in the bottom of your legs or your feet for example. Now capillaries are 
tiny vessels, they're microscopic vessels, you can't really see them with the naked eye, and they have very, very thin walls. The walls are only one cell thick, which means that it's only in the capillaries that substances are actually exchanged with the tissues. So the blood travels along the arteries until it gets to the capillaries which are in the tissues and then the substances are exchanged through the capillary walls. Now, they're very narrow, they're very thin-walled. This gives a short diffusion path for the exchange of substances with the tissues. It gives them a large surface area to volume ratio. And they're so tiny that the red blood cells have to squeeze through and sometimes the red blood cells have to be compressed in order to get through these capillaries. Now this often slows down the red blood cells and this allows a little bit more time for the diffusion of oxygen to take place. Let's have a look at the blood. Now you need to know the four main components of the blood. We have the red blood cells. These contain haemoglobin. Haemoglobin combines with oxygen in the lungs to form oxyhemoglobin. And when it reaches other organs, it splits up to release oxygen and you're left with haemoglobin. That then travels back to the lungs to pick up more oxygen. The white blood cells are present. They're part of our immune system. They defend against microbes. They have a nucleus. We have platelets. Now these are tiny fragments of cells. Now these are there to help to clot the blood when your tissues are damaged. They don't have a nucleus. And then there's the blood plasma. This is the liquid part of the blood. And it carries a lot of dissolved substances. It carries carbon dioxide to the lungs. It carries absorbed food molecules from the small intestine to all the other organs that need these food molecules. It carries urea from the liver to the kidneys where they're excreted in the urine. So this is a microscope image of red blood cells. That's actually my blood there. Now red blood cells don't have a nucleus. This allows them to carry more haemoglobin which means, therefore, that more oxygen can be transported in the blood. There are times when a patient may lose a large volume of blood. Something needs to be done about that. It's an emergency, isn't it? And there are several different artificial blood products which can be used in different circumstances. But these are only used in an emergency. These are only used to keep the patient alive until suitable donor blood can be found. So this might be carried in an ambulance, for example. Now, these artificial blood substitutes, they may just contain plasma, the liquid with dissolved nutrients and solutes in it, just to replace blood volume. If you've lost a large volume of blood, then your blood pressure can drop very, very low. So you need to bulk up the blood as an emergency measure. Sometimes artificial blood products just contain haemoglobin. It's a protein. It's the oxygen-carrying pigment. It doesn't need to be contained within a cell. So sometimes you may just get a transfusion of a haemoglobin product. Sometimes artificial blood products contain a synthetic oxygen carrier. And an example of a group of these is PFCs. And I can't remember what that stands for, and it doesn't matter. You don't need to know. But these are synthetic uh, chemicals which have a strong affinity for oxygen and they can be used in the circulatory system as an oxygen carrier. Now, of course, the whole point of artificial blood is just to keep the patient alive until suitable donor blood can be found. It's not a long-term solution. Now, the good thing about them is you don't need to tissue match them. We all know that we have different blood groups and if you give a patient a transfusion of the wrong blood group, then they can be in serious trouble. Artificial blood products don't need to be tissue matched, so you can keep a stock in your ambulance and just transfuse it into the patient and keep them alive while you seek proper tissue matched donor blood. So they're readily available. And these 
uh, chemicals are not transported in cells. There are no cells in these artificial blood products, which means then that this substance can pass through capillaries which have been squashed or damaged. So, for example, after injury, if the capillaries have been squashed to such an extent that blood cells couldn't pass through them, artificial blood can pass through and can therefore supply oxygen to tissues which might otherwise have died. The disadvantages are that they are for short-term use only. The haemoglobin-based products can be quickly broken down by the body and PFCs actually carry less oxygen than real blood. So donated blood is the effective long-term solution. You can transfuse donated blood into a patient in reasonably large volumes until their body recovers and they start making their own blood again. But the problem is donor blood is in short supply and it has to be tissue matched so there may be a delay while suitable blood is found for the patient. You can have various problems with the heart and circulatory system. Heart failure can happen and patients with heart failure obviously have a very limited lifespan and some may be lucky enough to receive an artificial heart. Now this is not a particularly long-term solution. Basically it's another stopgap. It's something to keep a patient alive while they're on the heart transplant list and there can be a long waiting list for this. Now in essence the artificial heart is a box made of probably plastic and titanium and it's a pump and it has controls and a rechargeable battery inside and it also has an external battery pack which is worn around the waist. Now that's the main power supply for the artificial heart but obviously if you're going to have a shower you can't go in when you connect it up to an external battery pack so that's removed and the rechargeable battery which is internal is what will keep you going long enough to have a shower. So the artificial heart will extend the life of a patient while they're on the transplant list. Now the advantages of an artificial heart are that it means you don't have to wait for a donor. The waiting list is very long and there's no tissue match needed because it's not biological tissue you don't have to worry about the rejection of the organ because it's the wrong tissue type. And it means that no drugs are needed to suppress your immune response, which is what has to happen if you have biological tissue transplanted. So they're very good. They extend the life of terminally ill patients while they're waiting for a heart transplant. The problem is that they're very large. They're much larger than a normal heart. And the natural response of the body whenever any foreign material is introduced into the body is to clot, clot the blood, because the body perceives it as an injury. And that's the problem with an artificial heart. It will trigger clotting. So the person needs to take anti-clotting drugs as long as they've got this artificial heart in place. It's not a long-term solution. They have a limited lifespan and it's a very expensive operation. Now, as we mentioned a minute ago, we have valves in the heart and the function of the valves is to prevent the backflow of blood. Now, sometimes our valves can become damaged or diseased. It's quite a common surgical procedure now to have valves replaced. Now, they can be replaced with valves that are made of synthetic materials, that's man-made materials, or they can be replaced with valves made of biological tissue. Now the mechanical valves, uh, again because it's foreign material, they can trigger clotting. So if you have mechanical valves, then you're going to have to take long-term anti-clotting drugs, anti-coagulation drugs. Biological valves can be made of animal tissue, but of course these can trigger an immune response. So the animal tissue has to be treated to prevent an immune response. They're chemically treated. Now the good thing about mechanical valves is that there's no risk of rejection because it's made of synthetic material and they're very long-lasting. They can last a lifetime. But the disadvantage is you have to take lifelong 
anti-clotting drugs, which may have implications if you're injured elsewhere in your body and you have restricted your own ability to clot blood when you wound yourself. Biological valves are good because there's no need for anti-clotting drugs because it's biological material, but they don't last as long. Now, some people suffer from coronary heart disease, which is the narrowing of the coronary artery. I mentioned it a minute ago. It's the artery that supplies the heart muscle with blood. Now, if this artery is narrowed, then it will restrict the blood flow. One way of treating it is to use a stent. Now, a stent can be used to widen the lumen of the artery. Now, this word lumen you will come across a lot if you carry on with biology. The lumen is the hole up the middle of any pipe. So the lumen of the artery is the bit the blood flows through. If you widen the lumen, then that allows the blood to flow more freely. So you can see here the problem with a narrowed artery is that it will restrict the blood flow. Now a stent is a small piece of kit. It's an expandable mesh and it's inserted into the artery through a keyhole incision and inside is a balloon. So it's kept very small and very slim. It's put into the position of where the narrow region is and then the balloon is gently inflated and this expands the stent. Now this widens the lumen and allows the blood to flow more freely. The little tiny balloon is then withdrawn and the stent is left where it is and it will hold your artery open. So here's some questions to test yourself on heart and circulation.